Um, my name is Elizabeth Lucia. I'm a second year master's trumpet student in the Masters of Kunisht, uh, which is a master's all about the music of Karl Heinz Strachhausen. Uh, this is a piece from Mitbach aus Licht, um, which I will be performing in the Holland Festival at the end of May and the early of June. Just give me a second to get yourself out. Yes, great. So again, welcome. Thank you all for coming. The title of my research project is Embodiment Empowerment, uh, Strachhausen's Orchestra Theme Lesson. Now to give you a little bit of background, I'm looking at the question, using Karl Heinz Strachhausen's orchestra theme lesson as a case study, how can a performer build body awareness and confidence? During my entire trumpet playing life, as you can imagine, um, hasn't been so long, it's been about 12 years, I have struggled with my identity as a woman in relation to my identity as a trumpet player. I grew up in a very small town in Alabama, which is not the most forward thinking place, and throughout my early development, through my uh, development in university in Chicago, Illinois, I started to feel more and more that I was being identified not just by my playing, but by who I was on stage. And that was something that I wasn't sure how to deal with. Because on one hand, I wanted to just say, no, my music is me, that's all it is, and really divorce it from my physical body on stage. And on the other hand, I wanted to say, no, but this, this, this is me, this is all of me, and I want that to be accepted on stage um, and in everyday life. And of course, uh, diversity and inclusion, especially women's rights, is something that has become more and more a part of our socioeconomic um, political discussions across the globe. Um, and that was mirrored at Darmstadt this past summer, which I was happy to attend. And Darmstadt, the festival, does a really wonderful job programming music from all kinds of composers from all different backgrounds. And the festival itself dedicated a one week uh, lecture series to the idea of diversity and inclusion, specifically in new music. That uh, concert and lecture series is called Defragmentation. And I was so excited. You know, as my first time at Darmstadt, <coughs> thinking, thinking about these ideas, I thought, yes, Darmstadt is the place to get answers. There are tons of forward people, forward thinking people. And so I went very enthusiastically to lots of these lectures. Um, and listened and questioned, and I finally got up the courage to raise my hand, actually, and ask a question in one of the uh, lectures. And I, I said, you know, this, is, this has been really great. Thank you so much for these lectures. It's really inspiring. Um, how can composers write music that empowers musicians? And how can musicians perform in a way that is empowering for themselves? And can, how can they practice in a way that's empowering for themselves? And the, the panel, actually, the moderator, and yeah, that's a really good question, and I think it's one we should all be asking. We're out of time, so if everyone can prepare for the next, and I was devastated, because I thought, well, you know, of course I had finally gotten up the courage at Darmstadt as a 23-year-old to raise my hand in front of these people who are my heroes, but also because I thought, well, no, this is, if this is a question we should be asking, we should be, let's talk about it. Let's not just ask questions, let's really try to find some answers. Um, and it's not about finding the answer, because I don't think that there is one answer. And that's certainly something that I've discovered through doing the research. Um, but I really wanted some concrete action items for how to approach, at least, my own practice as a minority on my instrument. Um, and one person at Darmstadt who really inspired me was Jennifer Walsh. Some of you might know her. She's an amazing composer um, and experimental vocalist. And she said, maybe is what is at stake is the idea that all music is music theater. Perhaps we're finally willing to accept that the bodies playing the music are part of the music, that they're present, they're valid, and they inform our listening, whether subconsciously or consciously. And that was something I really took to heart, especially in my preparation for the Stockhausen Masters. Some of you may know that Stockhausen uh, has a, I'm gonna say an interesting approach to gender because he worked with the musicians that he knew, um, and a lot of them were family or close friends, he, he wrote the parts in his opera for those people. So there exists a performance history, a performance practice of those people, those types of performers playing these roles. And for a trumpet, his son, Marcus Stockhausen, who's an incredible trumpet player, was 
besides the one who premiered almost all of the roles in Niche. Now, of course, Marcus Schauthausen is a very tall man, um, which I am not. <laughs> so there is a little bit of an issue um, approaching the Ausleicht production of saying, okay, well, there's this performance history um, of these roles being, being performed by man, but how can I use my body to perform these roles in the most convincing way possible? And that was something that I was also dealing with alongside of my own personal questions of how can I, as a woman, be also a trumpet player? And how, as a, as a trumpet player, can I also just be a woman? And that brings me to my thesis. Um, my research, uh, as you can see at the top, is in tandem with my work as a soloist, which you already saw, and to be cast member of the Ausleach production um, of the Dutch National Opera and Holland Festival. And this was really lucky for me because the production was actually sort of a ready-made incubator for my research. I used the cast of Orchestra Finalism as my study group to approach asking these questions of how can a performer get in touch with their body and feel confident about it and use that to give energy to their performance. Uh, so the cast of Orchestra Finalism, it's trumpet, <laughs> trombone, uh, horn, which is off stage, unfortunately, uh, we don't see the horn on stage at any point. Uh, oboe, clarinet, flute, violin, viola, cello, bass, and I was very, very happy to work with all of these um, musicians. And what I did is I sent them first a questionnaire, which had lots of demographic information about what kinds of music they've played in the past, if they've played any contemporary music, if they have any performance. Uh, movement related experience, and then what their core experience is in learning the music of Orchestra Femalism and performing the music of Orchestra Femalism is. And then I used those answers to inform the in person interviews, of which I did five um, later, which I want to say I made very uh, sure to not ask any leading questions with the interviews. Um, and I pursued them more in a narrative way because I really wanted to draw out their experiences and how they felt playing this music and how that transferred to their other kinds of playing. Um, and I also did my own personal role question, which I found was really important uh, and also helped with the interview process. So I took a really close eye to how I approached learning orchestra piano listen, what my process was like, where my improvements uh, were, where the biggest improvements were, where some setbacks were, and use that also to transfer to my other kinds of playing to see if I could apply the same process to uh, other music that I'm working on. There's already a little cast of orchestra from the listen. No one is yet. Um, but I'm going to start talking about my personal reflection. And I want to go back a little bit to what I was talking about the music of Schachhausen um, in terms of character and gender. He does say the sounds and intervals of the super formula are actually the characters, and that the people who realize the sounds represent them. So the true actors in the entire work of Leash are actually the, pic the pitches and the durations, the intensities and the colors and the tone forms of the super formula. Now this is really important because I don't want to confuse anyone who maybe isn't so familiar with Els Leash, because the characters in the opera are not like characters in Wagner or Mozart or any other opera that we might be more familiar with. The characters, if we want to use that word, are the sounds. And so being a figure on stage is as important as creating the sounds and playing them yourself, because that's really what you follow throughout the opera, is the development of these tones and these what we call the super formula. Um, so my part on stage is not only a dramatic one, but it's one that has to give energy to the music and receive energy from the music so that the entire picture and sound picture of Leash can come alive. What I noticed mostly in uh, my work on Orchestra Pian Listen, um, I started working on it, I guess, about a year ago exactly. My first performance was over the summer at the Chosendale International uh, Trumpet Institute, uh, a plug for Chosendale, it's a wonderful place. Uh, and I performed it twice there. And even within the one week in between my two performances of Trumpet de Dare, I noticed a substantial difference 
because of how I was approaching the music uh, mentally and physically. Um, I had already done lots of the preparation. I had already done the memorizing. I had already done the movement study, following the score, all the things with the tape that you might imagine. But what I noticed specifically within this week um, that I've been building on since then is that for my first performance and tracking my confidence level and how I approached my self on stage um, had to be a really positive one. As soon as I thought, well, I, I don't know, like should I, should I take this step or should I, should I go here? Then the movement wasn't convincing and the sound wasn't convincing either. So within the first performance and the second performance, the main change that I made was really committing to everything. And I'm gonna come back to that idea of commitment later when I talk about uh, Juliet, our movement coach, but I want you to keep it in mind because that's something that I also wanted to track with uh, my other interviews. So first we have Short, and I have all of the um, interview videos and transcriptions on the research catalog, but the interviews were between 10 and 15 minutes each. I did five of them plus a 30 minute interview with Juliet, so obviously we can't watch all of those, but I do wanna highlight a few things that they all said. Short said, I felt more free after Stockhausen. That freedom is something I've been in search of for a long time, and playing Stockhausen has really helped. Um, now I wanna show you a video of Short, uh, so you have an idea of what he has to do in orchestra piano lesson. No, there's no sound, but uh, as you can imagine, this is not something that he would have been asked to do before orchestra piano lesson. And that idea of freedom and flexibility obviously is about the sound. When he was talking about this, he meant uh, He's really had to work on his extremes of dynamic and character and tone color, um, but it also has to do with his actual movement because to be able to stand on one leg, play the bassoon, change dynamics, and not fall over, honestly, as it, which is something he highlighted as a major challenge, especially when you're just staring into lights uh, on stage. That's something that required him to become a more flexible performer, um, not one who just sits in a chair and, you know, Plays, whatever, which actually, I'll come back to this too, has a lot to do with your body, um, but that was something that he got in touch with through orchestra piano lesson. Um, now to our violist, Elisa. She said, you need to get a different kind of view on how you're going to play and how you're going to move your body. And I think you can translate that to any kind of playing, not just Stockhausen. So this again is kind of what Short was going through with the flexibility, the freedom idea of his playing, where she had to approach her eye, or she, because of what the score necessitated her to do, which I'll show you, she had to really look at her body critically and say, how am I gonna make this work? How am I gonna play the sounds, sing in tune, and move, when, until this point, I've had no training uh, on how to move on stage, to move in front of people, and utilize my body as a musical facility. And this is her demonstrating what she has to do. Research presentation last year on orchestra piano lesson, um, which shows because he says I think the characterization is the most interesting thing. It connects you with the piece. Otherwise, you just play notes. If you know the drama, it's more interesting and more special. So for him, with his performance, he really connected to the characters in Niche, which are Lucifer, Ava, and Michelle. And the bass, as he explained in his research last year, you should check it out. Some of the research catalog. Um, the bass is really a embodiment of Lucifer. And so getting in connection to that really grounded kind of energy through his body, let that come out in his playing. Um, and the overall characterization, which as I talked about before, is as much about who you are on stage as, is, as it is what your music is saying. Because as Stockhausen says, the characters are really in the notes. Um, I'll show you a short clip.
Oliver to Zong, our trombone player. He said, after playing orchestra piano lesson, I'm really thinking fully as a performer, as opposed to before, when I played standard repertoire and only thought about what was coming out of my bell. Now, I'm gonna, before I talk more about this, I wanna show you immediately the video of what he has to do. And this is all uh, done while playing blisses on the trombone. Very quickly, sometimes moving from very quick to very slow. And one thing that he had to figure out with Juliet, who I'll talk more about later, was how to connect his technical playing um, and the sound with the movement. Um, and he explained to me, which is actually super interesting, that he, with Juliet, found a way to coordinate the exact movement of the turn with the movement of the slide. So everything is super choreographed. Um, and then he said once he got that down, the sound was no longer an issue. So it was a, it was a movement thing that transferred into the sound because he said before when he was trying to do it, his sound was really quavery and shaky because he was doing all this movement. But as soon as he connected the movement and the flow um, with the glissandos, then it was all of a sudden easy almost. I mean, it's not easy, but it became easier. Um, and what's interesting with Don is that uh, he also has been working with Juliet and I in a, a class led by Renee of performance, uh, performance and communication. We had about four weeks with Juliet um, to really dig into our bodies and our presence. And he was in that class as well. And so it was interesting for me alongside talking to him for my master's research to see him progress in that class. And now he says about this, this idea of thinking fully as a performer, um, I found as soon as he said that, it, it kind of lit a light bulb over my head because this idea of embodiment for me is as much about integrating the music into your body as it is being fully integrated as a performer on the stage and not just being a vessel for Haydn or for Stockhausen or for any kind of repertoire, but being a performer who is bringing their full body and full energy into the performance. And this is something that I think Don was getting at when he said, that he was thinking fully as a performer, as a presence on stage, and not just about the notes coming out of his bell. We have one more uh, cast member before I move to Juliet, which is Daniela, who's the only person uh, other than myself in orchestra piano lesson who is uh, in the master das Licht. And he said, personally, it's really satisfying to play orchestra piano lesson. I feel quite powerful. I feel like it's my time to shine or to show who I am which I love, because if you know Daniele, this is absolutely something that he would say. Um, but it's also true, and this idea of, uh, of empowerment is something that he really feels on stage when he's playing orchestra piano lesson. And that is part of his character. Um, the clarinet is supposed to be just really holding the attention, but when you see him do it, it's just like what I did now. It's the difference between saying, I'm gonna play clarinet, and I'm the only person on stage, and saying, no, this is, this is my time. And he has to stand on his toes and play really high, and for him, having that mentality of power and saying, this is my stage right now, is as important to playing the notes as just playing the right note, which in the clarinet solo is very difficult because there are lots of microtones and uh, multiphonics as well. So moving to Juliet, who I said is our um, acting coach and she also works uh, and as, still as a dancer and a, as a choreographer, um, as well as an artistic um, director with Silver Day. Uh, and she said, you have to project. And to do that, you have to know that there's a space that you have to fill with energy. If you were not to project your music, then it would fall flat as well. It's the same with your body. It's your second instrument. You have to project it. And Juliet's idea, um, through working with musicians, I've worked with her for Invasion Explosion and Lucifer's Tons, and now also Orchestra Piano Lesson, um, is that really the body is your second instrument and that your movement, you create a score with it and that any extra movement is extra notes in the score and to really give power to the audience, just like you do with your playing, you have to be fully aware of what kind of energy you're sending out into the room and you can get that energy from your playing and you can also give energy to your playing when you have that kind of energy on the stage. Now, so how did this analysis work? 
Well, what I did first is I wanted to isolate commonalities between what everyone was saying through the questionnaire and through the interviews. And a lot of those things musically came down to memorization, because all this music has to be memorized, to the movement, and to tempi. And to me, those three things are all about the body. The movement, obviously, is in the body. The tempi have to be memorized. They have to be internalized. And uh, memorization, obviously, the music has to be fully ingrained in your uh, just mental memory and your physical memory. And all these things work together as well, they feed each other, because when you're doing movements, the movements, as you saw before when I played, the movements are in tempo, and you can, re you can remember the tempo just through taking a step, and it's immediately there. So I found these uh, commonalities, and I started thinking, okay, then why, why teach orchestra piano lesson? Why do orchestra piano lesson? Um, and does this give me any kind of answers to my overwhelming question of, how can you be embodied? How can you be empowered? Is there a way for composers to approach this question? Is there a way for musicians and teachers to approach this question? Which brings me to my conclusions. Um, through this research, it is clear that learning and performing Karl Heinz Stockhausen's orchestra piano lesson encourages music musicians to embody the music more fully. And I know I've been using the word embody a lot, but I hope that I've been, uh, at this point, made it clear that it's about bringing the music in and letting that feed energy that you can also put into your presence on stage and vice versa. Um, and that this uh, body awareness and awareness of physical presence on stage can also allow musicians to become empowered in themselves. And to say, it's not, I, I, am, my, I am my music, but it's not just my music, I'm also me. Which for me personally has been a really dramatic improvement of how I feel playing the trumpet and how uh, I can give energy on stage. When I feel like I can be on stage as a woman and as a trumpet player and as fully myself, I, I play better. Um, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think that's really, I mean, there's tons of uh, research about positive psychology and all this kind of thing, but that was something that for me I found important to really isolate and focus on because it was something that I heard over and over from the cast members, that they felt more powerful, that they felt more flexible, that they felt like they had uh, more facility and more energy to give to their music and to reach their audience. Um, and this idea of empowerment, uh, or this is where I reached the idea of empowerment, that you can actually teach this, that there are ways as a music teacher, instead of just talking about diversity and inclusion like a charm shot, which is really important to do, but it gives some very tactile tools for teachers and for students, um, whether it's personal use or work with your colleagues or work with students, um, even, even as a professional trying to grow your artistic awareness, that there are some things that you can do um, to feel empowered on stage and to help encourage uh, other performers, whether they be women or performers of color or trans performers or anything to really say, no, this is this is my space on stage and like I'm gonna show you. Which goes back to what Jennifer Walsh was saying about maybe what's at stake is the idea that all music is musical theater, that we're bodies on stage that inform listening subconsciously or consciously. And that goes with maybe more consciously with Stockhausen performing with movements that are choreographed or just standing in front of an audience and playing concerto and saying, okay, I feel myself, I feel myself grounded, I'm aware of the space and what I need to project in this space to make this an effective performance that's mine, not just what I'm playing. Um, and I would like to also highlight this last sentence. If we view musicians as a true part of the music, as a performer, and then equip them with tools to learn how their bodies can elevate the music, then the physical presence of the performer becomes a strength instead of a limitation or identifier. And I wanted to also uh, draw now a line to the Master of Das Liebst, because when I say, oh yeah, I'm studying Stockhausen, I'm in a Master's of Stockhausen, everyone says, well, that's, that's, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, you're studying one composer for two years, don't you feel like that's kind of limiting? Or what do you think you're really gonna do with that afterward? Which, if someone doesn't know the music, hasn't worked on it, is a very valid question. Um, and a good question to ask also as a student and a master to every once in a while go to myself and say, okay, what am I learning? What am I pursuing here? But what I've learned through the masters and through studying the music of Stockhausen um, is this idea of embodiment because of the key idea that 
the tones themselves are a character, and they are a line of energy throughout all of Leashed. And then if you follow that with your body, and you follow that with your projection into space, both with your energy, your uh, physical energy, and with your musical energy, you really start to get a lot back. Um, and before, because I know I've got about 15 seconds, um, before I ask for questions, um, I want to say a quick thank you uh, to Martha Wild, who's my trumpet teacher, to Renee Younger, who is the head of the Masters of Leashed, as well as the supervisor for this research, to the entire cast of Orchestra from the Listen, who were so, so gracious with their time um, and ideas and performance to help me out with this research, um, as well as to Juliette von Ingen, who is an incredible movement coach, and a lot of the work that uh, you saw that's gone into Orchestra from the Listen, which I played at the beginning, is uh, because of her. So thank you all. And does anyone have any questions? Okay, thanks for the presentation. I would like to start the questions with our external committee member, Peter Lee. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation, beautifully presented. Thank you. And opening up so many interesting avenues. And I hope you don't mind, I'm going to try and ask a, 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 to present a slight challenge because yeah, I'm just absolutely. interested in, in how you respond mm -hmm. to it because I can't, as it were, instantly formulate a response to it That's myself. Yeah. You make a very convincing case for this relationship between embodiment on stage mm -hmm. and empowerment of the performer. Mm -hmm. And it was making me think of the work that has been done, for example, on ballet dancers. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of work around um, trying to understand the, the relative disempowerment of ballet dancers, mm -hmm. which characterises them as possessing um, what's sometimes characterised as a docile body, a body that's been trained to right. do certain things. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole theoretical concept, uh, uh, sort of context for that. Right. But it all comes from comes from Foucault's discipline and punish, which just gives you a sense yeah, yeah. of where he's coming from. It's, a, right. it's not that's not relevant so necessarily here. But you see why there's a, a contrast in my mind between that mm -hmm. view of embodiment for because who is more embodied than, than a character than a dancer? Sure. And the issue of uh, empowerment that you and mm -hmm. Jennifer Walsh bring up. You're not yeah. by no means alone. How do you see that contrast? Yeah, I do. I definitely do think that there is a contrast, and the maybe there's a. I I want to be careful making this link, but that maybe there is a link between classical ballet training, like Russian school, French school ballet training, and you could say French or Russian school classical musician training, uh, where it is very strict and it is very drilled. I actually. Uh, as a fun side note, I was uh, actually trained as in Russian school ballet when I was uh, classical ballet when I was younger. So I, I kind of know the stick pounding routine <laughs> that that takes. Um, and you can say, well, that person's so embodied, they're so in touch with their body. I think maybe where there's a slight difference is that uh, obviously that's a very trained, controlled type of um, artistic dissemination sort of with ballet and really careful classical music playing. Um, not careful, but very precise classical music training. But I think what is most interesting to me is it, it kind of goes beyond exactly the what is being performed, uh, which, and it's more about how does a, how does a performer feel and how does that feeling allow them to get in touch with themselves and with the space and this this kind of transfer of energy because i do still think that with ballet dancers classical ballet dancers they still do have a very keen sense of uh themselves and their relation in space um as well as you think about musicians who are playing in a classical orchestra who have to know exactly what the hall is doing and how their sound goes in the hall um and i think maybe also as well um, there is quite an issue with diversity and uh, gender relations in ballet. And I think that maybe, and I'm, I don't want to be so proud as to say, well, this could help them, <laughs> but 
I think that maybe if there was a little bit more focus on who the body, the body belongs to, because that really is a key element in gender and diversity and inclusion conversations in general, is like, who does this body belong to? What is the background of that body? What is the uh, cultural and historical context of that person and, and that place in the political conversation or whatever? I think it's more a little bit on this level um, and not necessarily in the performance itself. I think that there's a, that's kind of the avenue that you can travel between this conversation and the performance and just a way to make the performer feel good. And which is, you know, maybe a little trite to say, oh, you just want to feel good on stage. But I do think if you if you feel good on stage and people see that, then it, it sparks something. Um, and that kind of teaching and that kind of awareness and conversation can hopefully, hopefully bring more diversity and more empowerment on stage to people of color or gender. wondering because when you started out and also the two times you were talking now the gender issue was was, was mentioned. Mm -hmm. You've been a minority of the Trump players. Yeah. And I saw the interview you had with the other musicians and you said somehow you didn't respond to that even though you brought it up. Yeah, and I so think. And you let it go kind of, I felt, was your decision. Sure. You didn't push it. And also your interview with uh, Juliet, you made quite an effort to, to get the gender agenda in there. Yeah. And she didn't quite respond to talking to your question. Yeah, I um so what happened? I I think with the musicians, the cast of Orchestra Feel Listen, I didn't want to push the, the gender question with them because it's something that's very personal for me. And I am aware that in this kind of conversation I can be like, well what about women or what about musicians that, like trans musicians or what about this? And I think for the people that I interviewed Specifically in the context of their performance of Orchestra Feel Listen, it just wasn't relevant. Um, with Juliet, we did have more of a conversation about gender um, or about diversity in, in general. Uh, with her, when we talked about it a little bit also outside of this interview, that conversation was more about race. Um, the diversity conversation was more about race. Uh, and I think as far as I didn't want to let it necessarily let it go, but I know that the, that part of the research is more something that's more personal, um, and it's I would rather use because I didn't I don't think I said this in my presentation I didn't want to do a feminist research presentation I wasn't thinking about it, but I thought I'm just going to be angry for months if I, if I just talk about women and new music, um, and I didn't want that because I I wanted to come up with something that could be more applicable to more people. Yeah. And my personal experience, the, the lens that I view personally, diversity and inclusion is one of gender, but I didn't want the whole research to be about that because if for a colleague of color, then it's, it's not really important. I wanted to make something that was a little bit more intersectional. I see, but then at the beginning you said to yourself, oh, the words that you mentioned, and then I saw that it was tantalizing. I mean, mm -hmm. it was quite deliberate. In the mm. course of the interviews, mm. uh, I was looking forward to that aspect of it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't understand what you've done, so that's not the question. <laughs> but anyway, so there's room, room for more. Yeah, definitely. And it is something that I do want to, this research is something that I would like to take forward. Um, you know, with, with the length, two years of the master's isn't really, for me, enough time to explore mm. such a huge thing as broadly as I would like to. I went to Renee in the early stages of my research saying like, this is my plan, and he was like, shrink it. Shrink it, which is, which is very good advice because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to go in depth with my colleagues. Um, but it's something that I'm looking at continuing to pursue, especially with musicians um, like Jennifer Walsh or she, who's, I, she's just a hero of mine, so I keep saying her name. But um, because I think that there is more to look at with that kind of thing. Short question, I have a little short answer. How does the movement subscribed by Sokhan compare to Classic Bound? Um, I would quickly say it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> Schaffhausen was not a theater man, nor a, a movement guy. Uh, the movements were mostly, in general, the movements 
were created by the people who were premiering them. So if you look at Agnes Lee, they were mostly created by Katinka and Susie. Um, and I think a lot of the movements, if you think about over uh the trumpet player has to lie down. It was because Marcus needed to lie down, he was getting dizzy. So some of the movements were just practical or created by the people. They said, this feels good, I'll step like this. And that became the movement. With others, there are specific things. They said in the trumpet score, it says the different sounds need to be played in different directions and steps need to be made. Usually I would walk down a flight of stairs and those were created by Stockhausen in his dramatic vision. But for me and from what I've read, there's no connection to ballet other than just with working with Juliet, learning like, okay, my center of gravity is here and now it's here and I can shoot it here and And then if we're playing 
playing, if we're doing that movement while we're playing this sound, how does one thing, how does this sound give us energy to step here? Or how does our step give energy to send the sound here? Which for uh, Invasion Explosion is hugely important since you are working in a take that's sending sounds all across the room. So the, the element of space and energy with sound is really, really important there as well. So can I, uh, since the, is there a way of making use of what you found in a, a non-dramatic ensemble setting? So the sound mm -hmm. is in an orchestra or a, a small ensemble with sound, so it's really the music sound. Mm -hmm. Aside from the breathing is there anything else that you do to complete yeah. the group? Yeah, I think that uh, then this goes into the idea of empowerment because I did grow up playing in orchestras and playing in, uh, there's so many times that if we're talking about gender that I was the only woman in a brass section and that felt, there were a lot of situations for a lot of reasons that that felt bad and I think that I, I where I don't think, I know that I have colleagues of color who have been in sim similar positions and or being just in a conservatory where you're, don't feel like you have ownership over the music you're playing for any variety of uh, contextual reasons about uh, historical backgrounds, political backgrounds, foreign attachments, whatever. And I think the idea of if you, for me, and what I've found through the research is that if you really do have a heightened awareness of your body and how you're producing the sound and the energy that takes and how that energy goes into the room and you have the tempos in you and you maybe have some of the music memorized, whatever it takes for you to feel like that music is in you and embodied, then the music's yours. And the idea of um, empowerment then can come from a place of saying, well, this is my music, uh, whatever it is. If it's Schockhausen for me right now, or if it's Copeland, or if it's Mahler, or whatever, then if I'm just speaking about myself, I can go into it saying, no, like this is, this is mine, and then I feel empowered, and then this is a process that, especially in conservatories or orchestras, can hopefully lead uh, to more, mu more musicians feeling like, okay, let's do this, or you can do this, which is even better if someone can say, yeah, you've got it, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. We will thank now you. go to the jury room and see you all in uh, some time.